Good evening, folks. Welcome to our Grow Groups. And we're looking this evening at Zechariah chapter 12. So let's read that chapter together. If you have a Bible or please follow along in your own Bibles. Beginning at verse 1. The oracle of the word of the Lord concerning Israel. Thus declares the Lord, who stretched out the heavens and founded the earth and formed the spirit of man within him. Behold, I'm about to make Jerusalem a cup of staggering to all the surrounding peoples. The siege of Jerusalem will also be against Judah. On that day, I'll make Jerusalem a heavy stone for all the peoples. All who left it will surely hurt themselves, and all the nations of the earth will gather against it. On that day, declares the Lord, I will strike every horse with panic and its rider with madness. But for the sake of the house of Judah, I will keep my eyes open when I strike every horse of the peoples with blindness. Then the clans of Judah shall say themselves, The inhabitants of Jerusalem have strength through the Lord of hosts, their God. On that day, I will make the clans of Judah like a blazing pot in the midst of wood, like a flaming torch among sheaves. And they shall devour to the right and to the left all the surrounding peoples, while Jerusalem shall again be inhabited in its place in Jerusalem. And the Lord will give salvation to the tents of Judah first, that the glory of the house of David and the glory of the inhabitants of Jerusalem may not surpass that of Judah. On that day the Lord will protect the inhabitants of Jerusalem, so that the feeblest among them on that day shall be like David. And the house of David shall be like God, like the angel of the Lord going before them. And on that day I will seek to destroy all the nations that come against Jerusalem. And I will pour out on the house of David and the inhabitants of Jerusalem a spirit of grace and pleas for mercy. So that when they look on me, on him whom they have pierced, they shall mourn for him as one mourns for an only child. And weep bitterly over him, as one weeps over a firstborn. On that day the morning in Jerusalem will be as great as the morning for Hadad Rimmon in the plain of Megiddo. The land shall mourn, each family by itself, the family of the house of David by itself, and their wives by themselves, the family of the house of Nathan by itself, and their wives by themselves, the family of the house of Levi by itself, and their wives by themselves, the family of the Shimeites by itself, and their wives by themselves, and all the families that are left, each by itself, and their wives by themselves. Amen. We're going to look here at Zechariah 12 tonight under the title Salvation Through Mourning. But before we look at this chapter, I want to just recap on what has been the content of the book of Zechariah so far. And the reason I'm doing this is that the preacher's task in many ways is twofold. Yes, it is to bring a message from God's word, but also it is to teach God's word so that God's word will become more accessible for people as they read that word themselves. So as we look at Zechariah, as a summary of it, it begins in chapter 1, verses 1 to 6 with a call to repent. Here we see the purpose of the big of the book is so that the people of Jerusalem who have come back from 70 years exile in Babylon, that they will not repeat the sins of their forefathers, but that they will be faithful to the Lord. And so the first six verses of chapter one as the introduction is a call to repent. And then the rest of chapter one through to chapter six In those six chapters, we have eight visions which speak of God's actions in this world for his people. Eight pictures which help us understand what God is doing in the world. In chapter 7 to 8, we have the question about fasting being dealt with by the Lord. And then the book finishes with two oracles, chapters 9 to 11. There's an oracle about the future and particularly about shepherds uh, the climax of that is speaking about the palm sunday story the king coming riding on a donkey the good shepherd coming and then chapters 12 to 14 it's god's oracle or god's prophecy about that day now in these chapters 12 to 14 that day 
which is generally referred to in the Bible as the day of the Lord, that day can have different levels of fulfillment. It can have a, a fulfillment which is very soon with the God's judgment on his enemies in, in time. His fulfillment would be a bit later in the first coming of Jesus to be the saviour. And then his fulfillment ultimately would be the second coming of Jesus, the judgment which will come of that, and the defeat of God's enemies forever, the bringing in the new heavens and the new earth. So three levels of fulfillment. Short term, judgment on God's enemies. Middle term, the coming, the first coming of Jesus as Saviour. And long term, the coming of Jesus as the judge. And the important thing when we look at a prophecy like this, it's not to get tied up and not trying to think about when every part of it's going to be fulfilled. Rather, we need to look at the passage and see what is the truth it's teaching us about God, about God's ways of working, about God's people and what he requires of them. So let's get into this chapter together. And first of all, we see in verse 1, the Lord of the oracle. The word oracle here can be translated as burden. And so it's a message that's not something light or trivial, but it's something that is heavy and serious, something to take to heart. And this message we see in this first verse is from the Lord, uh, translating the Hebrew word Yahweh, the name by which God revealed himself to Moses. He is the, the great creator God. And we see that in verse 1, to speak of how God in his power, he stretched out the heavens, how God has founded the earth. And so the message is coming from a God who is glorious, exalted and majestic. But he's also a God who's very intimate with his people. Because look at the end of that first one. It says how he formed the spirit of man within him. We think of the work of creation. How God, he just didn't say let man exist as he did with the animals. He formed man out of the dust of the ground and he breathed life into him. And so it speaks here how God has formed the spirit of man within him. Something very intimate. This is a God who wants to know people very closely. So this is a Lord of the Oracle. A God who is high, exalted, majestic and powerful. But the God who comes near and is intimate with his people. And then we see secondly the victory for God's people in verses 2 to 6. The people of God will be targets of the world's wrath. And here we see in verses 2 to 3 how the nations of the world gather in siege around Jerusalem. And as we think of Jerusalem in the Bible and prophecy, we should see Jerusalem not just as that city long ago, but as a, a picture of the people of God, the church of Jesus Christ. God's people will always be under attack in this, this world. These attacks happen for a time, but then the Lord turns them around for the good of his people. And this is a, a message here of how a people under attack, a people under great pressure, how God will change the whole situation. Jerusalem is going to be a, made into a, a cup of staggering at verse 2. The nations will become like a, a drunk man who is struggling to walk and to stand at all. The nations are going to be vulnerable and pulled down. Jerusalem is described in verse 3 as being a, a heavy stone. The nations come against Jerusalem think, ah, it's like a pebble that they can just carry away or throw away and discard. But it's going to be this great stone that cannot be moved by God's grace. This great stone by trying to lift it, the nations are hurt. And so it speaks of how God brings security for his people. The church will be built and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. It speaks of how the, in verse 4 about the horses and the riders of the enemies of God's people, how they indeed will be struck. They were the, the main weapons of war in those day, horses. It speaks of how they'll be struck with panic, it will be struck with blindness. It mentions that in those verses. In the face of these enemies who come, it says in verse 5 how God's people 
will be strengthened. And this is a, a wonderful thing. The Lord provides all the strength that we need for the battle. We live in this world in a spiritual warfare. We must always remember that every day is a spiritual battle. The forces of evil come against God's people. But God gives the strength that is needed. He gives us his strength to carry us through. And things are turned around from being defensive to attack in verse 6, where God's people will become like a, a blazing pot, it says, like a flaming to torch that will devour the nations. God's people will be victorious over their enemies. The day will come when God's people will see all their enemies cast away forever in their defeat and in the judgment of God. So here we see the victory for God's people. Remember, at this time, the people of God at Jerusalem were a remnant. They were at a city that had been destroyed. They were trying to struggle in building the temple. They felt vulnerable. Here they're told that they will be a victorious people. And when we belong to Jesus, the day comes when the victory that Christ has secured at the cross will be evident for all to see. And then the third thing we see is salvation from the house of David in verses 7 to 10. As this oracle, this prophecy focuses on salvation, the focus comes on the house of David, the family line that comes from that king. The house of David is likened to God and to the angel of the Lord in verse 8. The angel of the Lord is that person who appears to Abraham to Samson's father and others in the Old Testament who someone who is sent from the Lord who is the Lord and that the angel of the Lord is believed to be none other than than the son of God even before he came into the world of heaven it's him appearing in the Old Testament he is the angel of the Lord and God's people are likened to God to the angel of the Lord it speaks of points to the time when this man will come from the family of David, from the house of David, who would be a man, but who would also be God. It speaks of the divine nature of Christ. And through this Christ, who is the son of David, on the house of David and through the house of David will flow a spirit of grace and mercy. It says there in verse 10. This God who has so many reasons to just cast off his people for all their failings of sin. He's a God of patience, a God who gives them grace, a God who gives them his spirit of mercy in these days. And how does this come? How does God's grace, how does God's mercy come to his people, a people who don't deserve this? Well, in verse 10, it speaks there about how it comes through the one who is pierced. It speaks, of course, of the one who would be crucified. And so here in the Old Testament, as in the New Testament, salvation is clearly spoken of, of being through Christ, through the one who is pierced, through his death on the cross, through him being nailed to that cross. Salvation comes to his people. Salvation from the house of David. Salvation through the son of David, born in Bethlehem. The Christ, the Lord. And then fourthly we see in this chapter the mourning of God's people. The salvation has to come with mourning. In reference to the one who is pierced in verse 10, this brings about a great deal of mourning. And indeed in verses 10 to 12, mourning or weeping is referred to seven times. Initially, the mourning within the house of David and in Jerusalem is because of the one who has been pierced. Because of the one who they have pierced. Salvation is from the pierced one who his own people were guilty of piercing. Yes, we think of how it was the Romans who had Jesus crucified. But the Romans were acting, remember, on behalf of the Jews. It's the Jews who instigated. It's the Jews that called for. It was the people of Jerusalem who cried out, crucify him, crucify him. And many of those people, as you remember, 50 days or so later on the day of Pentecost, 
they are cut to the heart as they're told of the message of Christ, the Son of God who's risen from the dead and ascended to glory. As they're cut to the heart, many of those people who cried, crucify him, crucify him, now say, what must we do? And they turn in faith to Christ for salvation. And this is why there is mourning. It's mourning because they and their sin require Jesus to be crucified. They are responsible for his death and so they mourn for his death. And you know, for all of us who are Christians today, okay, we weren't in Jerusalem. We weren't among those who cried crucify him. We weren't those who nailed him to the cross. But it's our sin that took him to the cross. It's our guilt that made it necessary for Jesus to die there. And therefore, if we love Christ, if we love this perfect Saviour, we should mourn the sin. We should mourn the sin within our hearts that caused Christ to have to die. So it speaks here of this morning. This morning is very personal in verse 10. It speaks of the morning as a, for an only child or for a firstborn. And that alludes back to the member the the death of the firstborn in Egypt and how indeed the firstborn of Israel from that time had to be redeemed, pointing forward to how it would be the firstborn of God who would suffer and die. And this speaks of something that's very personal. This speaks of a, a pain that is intense. You think of someone crying for a firstborn who has died, the intense pain of that. You know, we can't fool about with this. We can't fool about it with sin. You cannot be a follower of Jesus and treat sin in a trivial way, the sin that took Jesus to the cross. We have to mourn that sin. Yes, Christianity is to be about joy. Rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I say rejoice, Paul says. Yes, but that joy comes through the path of mourning for our sin. We mourn our sin and then we rise in the grace of of the Saviour. Just as we think there of these speaks about the morning, we see a, a reference there in verse 11 about the morning for Hadad Rimmon in the plain of Megiddo. Megiddo, otherwise known as Armageddon, it was the place where there was a great battle and King Josiah, the last good king of Judah, he was killed there at Megiddo. And it speaks of a people mourning the death of their king. We are to mourn the death of our saviour. Yes, we rejoice that he brings us salvation. But we can never think of the cross without thinking of it also with sadness. Being a Christian means to come to know Christ. It centres into a relationship with Jesus. And surely as we enter into that relationship, more and more what he has suffered should matter to us and really impact every area of our lives. This morning is to be something extensive. It's just something that goes right throughout all the people of God. We see that in verses 12 to 14. Uh, mourning and weeping. Uh, those phrases is, are mentioned many times. Seven times in verses 10 to 12, mourning and weeping is used. And we continue this theme to the end of the chapter. It speaks about families, tribes personally mourning. You know, as you say, Christianity is about a relationship with Jesus. Jesus is pure. Jesus is holy. Jesus is righteous. Jesus knows everything about us. He knows the worst about us. And we can't come to Jesus and put on a front. We can't cover up our sin. He's aware of all our fin, sin and the failing. So one of the major parts of coming to Jesus in prayer every day has to be confessing our sin, mourning our sin. Yes, of course, moving on then from our sin. But we have to be real, real with him, with our sin. Salvation, the life of fullness, the life of abundance, the life of fruit, the life of blessing. It's a life that comes first through mourning our sin 
the sin that took Jesus to the cross. But praise God, we have a Saviour who on that cross deals with that sin to bring us this new life. Amen.